Welcome to Stand in the Gap Today from the American Pastors Network. We proclaim truth in the public square by connecting a biblical worldview and constitutional principles to the most significant news of the day. Simple, careful, and truthful. That's Stand in the Gap Today. Now, here's your host. Well, thank you so much for tuning into this edition, uh, Friday edition of Stand in the Gap Today. I'm Isaac Crockett, and I'll be joined, of course, by the Honorable Sam Rohr, our Stand in the Gap Today host and the president of the American Pastors Network. And though today may be April 1st, uh, Sam, we're, we're not planning on fooling around today. Uh, there's uh, no April Fools today. We have a special returning guest. Um, Zan Tyler is going to be on the program with us. In fact, Zan, just thank you so much for, for making time in your busy schedule and a lot going on. Uh, for you that you you made time to be with us. Thank you so much for being on the program with us today. Well, Isaac, it is my pleasure and privilege, and I appreciate so much the ministry that you all have with pastors and the Ukraine parents everywhere. So thank you. Well, um, Zan, I, we have a lot we want to ask you about and, and get, uh, get your voice on uh, some of these things. Uh, we want to talk about how we have forgotten God and tie this into what you saw as you were over in Russia with homeschool conferences over in Russia, you work with homeschooling here in the States. We want to talk about training our children, training our grandchildren in order to, to lead to a revival here in the United States and all over the world. Uh, but before we get into all that, just uh, a reminder for those in, in our listening audience who maybe don't uh, know you or know a lot about you or remember some of the past programs you've been on. But uh, you've been involved with homeschooling since uh, late last century, um, uh, 1900. That sounds so old when we say it that way. But in, in fact, you have been working with homeschooling since 1984, back when it was illegal in your state of South Carolina, back when you faced going to jail for, for being a, a parent, you know, that was committing truancy or whatever. Um, can you just give us kind of a nutshell of, uh, you know, from somebody who you never thought you'd be a stay-at-home mom, a quote, stay-at-home mom, you never thought you'd be involved with homeschooling, and uh, and then you have now spent uh, decades of your life not only homeschooling your own children but helping other people, uh, standing up for for the rights of of Christian families to homeschool their children, and uh, you've become an author about homeschooling, a speaker, just sought after all over the country and all over the world, and just an overall homeschool specialist. Could you just kind of give us a nutshell of of what happened that changed things in your life in that respect? Sure. I think it's sort of that overriding principle for all of us. Many are the plans in the mind of man, but God directs his steps. And so we are, so I found myself in 1984 with a son in kindergarten who was not doing well. He was bright, gregarious. He was the only one in the class not reading, and I knew something was wrong. I wasn't sure what. I took him out of school, and a, a friend of mine gave me a book to read called Homegrown Kids. It's, I believe it's out of print now. But she said, Zan, I've been a public school teacher for many years. I'm going to homeschool my kids. Well, Isaac, it was the first time I had ever heard the word homeschool. And in that moment, I felt like I was in that scene in Star Wars with the trash compactor where the walls are closing in on the four heroes, and I, all I could think of was I, I've got to get away from this person and clear my mind. But I got home, I read this book. It gave me the most amazing vision of education where parents and children are involved together. It's a warm, responsive environment. Service to others is a keystone rather than popularity. And it, it really... It was like the Holy Spirit just moving in my heart and making me want this. But here again, it's 1984. I don't know anybody in the world who is actually homeschooling. No support groups, no state groups, no nobody who could help me, no Internet. And uh, so I just told the Lord I was sorry I couldn't do this. And so the next few months of my life was God just bringing me to the point where I said yes to him because he had to he had to harden hearts friend of mine friends of mine in the school district who wouldn't let me hold tie back and the school district denied my application to homeschool and then I went to see the state superintendent who was a friend of my mother's he had actually observed her classroom when he was getting his PhD in education at her public school classroom 
and and he threatened me with jail. And it was in that moment, funny enough, interestingly enough, in that moment where the superintendent of education said, Zan, I can put you in jail if you continue down the homeschool path, that I really knew that God was calling me to this venture. And it's just been the most amazing journey I could have ever been on as a a woman, as a wife, as a mother. Um, I I wouldn't trade anything for it. Well, Zan, it's kind of interesting listening uh, to your story uh, because my wife and I began to homeschool in the 80s. We're in Pennsylvania, and uh, the laws began to change at that point. We were one of the very first as well here. I mean, it was early on, just like you're talking about. But I'm curious, from from your perspective, when you look back now at the... uh, at the involvement with your children and the education that they received, would you now, after looking back over all this time, do anything differently? I mean, how many times have you thanked the Lord that you made that choice, or (laughs) you said, why did I make that choice? Just a few of your thoughts as you look now back on that time. Oh, that that is such a great question, And I am so thankful, like you said, that the Lord didn't listen to me about what I wanted with my life. I wanted to go to law school. That was my plan, practice law with my dad, who was he was an attorney but not practicing at that point in time. You know how when you're young you have all these plans in your mind. And, And I'm so thankful he didn't listen to me. I cannot imagine raising children any other way. Now, was I a perfect mother? Absolutely not. Did I do things wrong? Absolutely. Were there things I I wish I could change in the way I handled some things? Absolutely. But as a family, we were a group of imperfect people learning and growing together and learning to love the Lord Jesus, and I wouldn't trade that for the world. Mm. Amen. And, and, you know, as we talk about this today— uh, you know, one of the points I want people to think about, whether it's a parent, a grandparent, uh, an extended family member of some child, it's the influence that we can have on our own children. So many times I hear people complaining about all the bad things in society that are ruining our children. But God has given children to the home. God has given children to the parents. And it doesn't matter what the government says. It doesn't matter what schools say. It doesn't matter what society says. It matters what God tells parents. And so if you're listening, you have the responsibility to rear your children. And I'm not you know, suggesting that everybody has to do it the way I do it or the way Sam or Zan has done it. But if you're a parent, you are responsible. You are given that charge by God. And um, we're, we're coming into our first break where we're going to hear from some of our partners but uh, I, I just so appreciate, Zan, what you did and what you've done. Uh, I appreciate your testimony. And um, I'm just uh, thankful for this opportunity that we can share with other people um, what, what is going on. And we want to look at how we can really see revival by training our own children and, and many opportunities through homeschooling that that comes into. And uh, so when we come back, we want to talk to, um, after hearing from our partners, we want to talk to you, Zan, about some interesting things that happened at a conference for homeschooling in Russia. Uh, Very interesting. I don't think you'll want to miss this. We're going to take a quick time out. We'll be right back with author, speaker, Zan Tyler, talking about a homeschool conference in Russia right after this. Listeners all across America are thanking God for Stand in the Gap today. Listen to what Carol, a faithful partner from Southeast Pennsylvania, says about Stand in the Gap today. Hello, my name is Carol, a regular and faithful listener of Stand in the Gap today, a daily one-hour program heard Monday through Friday. The program hosts talk to interesting and fascinating guests who will discuss some of the most important issues of our day and time from a constitutional and biblical worldview. I hope you will join me for Stand in the Gap today. A daily one-hour program heard Monday through Friday. 
You'll be so glad you did. And remember, the American Pastors Network covets your prayers and financial support. Thanks, Carol. Your prayer and financial support of this program has helped us to become the main source of trustworthy news analysis for so many people. If you're listening to me right now and you've never contacted us like Carol did, would you do so now? Partner with us in prayer and finances by going to StandInTheGapRadio.com. And if you're benefiting from this program, tell a friend. All across America, parents find themselves considering whether homeschooling might be a viable option for their children during this time of COVID lockdowns and mask mandates. As a homeschooling mom, I'd like to tell you why BJU Press offers you the support and materials you need to give your child a well-rounded education. BJU Press approaches each subject from a biblical worldview perspective. God and His Word aren't just an add-on in Bible class. Rather, our amazing, all-powerful, creative, majestic God is present not only in science and history, but in English, math, reading, music, art, and more. Your children will be challenged and encouraged to seek Him with all their hearts, while learning and growing in wisdom and knowledge. And isn't that what we want for them? Whether you prefer a traditional textbook education, the flexibility of online learning, or a mix-and-match approach, BJU Press has what you need. Visit their website at BJUPressHomeschool.com. That's BJUPressHomeschool.com. The Bible teaches us to count it all joy when we face trouble or persecution. How can we find real joy in times of trouble? Hello, I'm Sam Rohr with another Stand in the Gap Minute. This week we've looked at the persecution that we should expect as believers and how to respond to it. But James 1-2 adds that we're to count it all joy, but why? Well, the verse adds that the testing of our faith produces steadfastness or resilience. When we experience suffering, we build our endurance. Just as exercise builds the strength of our physical body, persecution strengthens our spirit. A workout may not feel like fun at the time, but consistent effort leads to much improvement. In a similar way, consistently facing persecution with joy deepens our faith and makes us more effective in living for God. So don't fear persecution. Count it all joy today. Discover more at AmericanPastorsNetwork.net. A male sportswoman of the year? This is Ken Ham heading up the ministry that built a full-size evangelistic Noah's Ark. Last year, a biological male who lifts weights and identifies and competes as a woman was named Sportswoman of the Year. Transgender ideology is anti-biblical and goes against observational science. And it's a war on women, one that's erasing them and hurting real people, including those caught up in gender transitions. Why is it happening? It's because people refuse to believe the truth of God's Word. Their darkened minds can't see the foolishness of what they believe. But we can clearly see this as foolishness when we start with Genesis, male and female, he created them. We need to turn to the timeless Word of God. Discover more about God's design for us when you visit our website at AnswersRadio.com and listen to this Bible upholding program again when you go to AnswersRadio.com. You're listening to Stand in the Gap today. For more information, visit our website at StandInTheGapRadio.com. Well, welcome back to the program. I'm Isaac Crockett, uh, and Sam Rohr is with me today. And we're talking to a friend of ours and a uh, uh, return guest to this program, Zan Tyler. We're talking about homeschooling and how parents and grandparents, family, extended family, uh, can invest in children and, and, and see really a, a, renew, uh, a renewal um, by in our country, coming back to the Lord, a revival, and uh, those are things we talk about a lot on this program. We also talk a lot about biblical worldview. And so if you try to imagine, you know, for me as a parent, um, well, actually my wife, she grew up in the same time period that Zan was talking about, the 1980s. Zan and Sam were talking about homeschooling their children. My wife and I grew up in that time period. Her parents um, uh, lived in New York. Uh, my wife was adopted from from Kolkata, India, Grew up in New York State. Her dad uh, worked for the public school system, retired after 30-some years. While he was working for the public school system, they were homeschooling their four children. And uh, and it was the choice they made. So for, for my wife and I, seven years ago when it was time, I was working, teaching in public schools as well. But we decided to homeschool our children too because it gives us opportunities to, to instill the Word of God and a biblical worldview in our own children. It's our responsibility 
to rear our children. And, uh, and so, you know, if you're wondering about what that's like, now imagine with me another country, a communist country, a country like Russia with socialism and communism and doesn't have the biblical worldview that our country was founded on. What in the world would they do to, to do homeschooling? How would that look? What would that be like? Well, Zan, you had the opportunity to experience that firsthand. You speak all over the United States. You get invited to go outside the United States, and occasionally you, you, you go there. But you actually had the opportunity to go over to Russia for a homeschooling conference. Can you just tell us about what that was like to be invited, uh, of all places, to Russia? Well, it was pretty amazing, Isaac. It was in 2018, and it was a result of the work of the Global Home Education Exchange, uh, GHEX. And they they had been working in Russia with Russians for quite a while in this developing homeschooling movement over there. So there were actually two conferences. One was in St. Petersburg and one was in Moscow. And so I spoke at both of those. The one in Moscow had probably a thousand Russian nationals with parents and children there. It was quite an amazing sight to behold. And, and Zan, let me ask you a further follow-up question that, um, who sponsored that? Was that uh, a government-sponsored event? You said and this was 2018? 2018. Uh, actually, it was sponsored, I believe, by the Global Home Education Exchange, uh, which was set up originally by Homeschool Legal Defense Association. But they were working in conjunction with uh, many Russians that were just Russian nationals. Okay. There. Okay. So that that's very interesting because then, so the government at that point, obviously, this was not under the Soviet Union. This is under Russia. That's right. Putin would have been the president at that point. That's right. And there was a senator there who stood up and spoke about homeschooling like I couldn't believe. It it was really an amazing window in time. Hey, Isaac. Well. So um, what were some of the issues that they were facing that led them, you know, to want to develop um, uh, a homeschooling, you know, at not just this conference, but really develop a curriculum in a, a situation where they could school their own children? Because, again, you know, they're coming from the Iron Curtain, as we call it. My, I remember my dad working in Soviet Union, bringing Bibles and things to the underground uh, churches back when Gorbachev was still in power. And uh, everybody was just kind of funneled. You were told where you went to school, where you worked. Parents and children were separated most of the day. Um, and so, you know, I'm trying to imagine even after the, the quote-unquote fall of the Iron Curtain, uh, society was structurally changed and so far different, you know, from Christian nations like America was founded to be. Um, what, what kind of damage, collateral damage, was there even, you know, the, you know, generation later or something when you're there talking to these people as you're kind of trying to formulate a whole new a way of, of schooling their children? Well, probably the best thing I can do is illustrate this with a story. At one point, um, Father Dimitri got up and spoke, and I would say he was an elderly uh, man in his 80s. It was, and, and all of this is being done through translators. We, you know, we have the earpieces on, so we're having the Russian translated for us as the English, as the Americans there. And he started talking about Russia and what Russia was like. He said he grew up under the scourge of communism. He witnessed things like 85,000 priests being killed, 29,000-plus churches being decimated, and hundreds of thousands of Christians and academicians and artists being executed. And he talked about how devastating that was for the family. As a matter of fact, when Joe and I, not only for Christians, but for the family, when we were there, we went on a tour and we saw some of the dilapidated factories during the World War II era where uh, there were apartments next door and parents would drop their children off while it was dark, go work in the factories all day long and pick them up 
when it was dark again. And he he really said that communism had ravaged the family, the church, and the Russian culture. And the only way he could see to build the Russian family back up was through this thing called homeschooling. He said, I'm an old man, but I'm going to spend the rest of my years advocating for homeschooling because I believe homeschooling will build strong families. We need strong families to rebuild the church in Russia, and Russia needs strong churches to rebuild the culture. And it it was, I just remember sitting there weeping as I'm listening to this man talk. It was one of the most moving moments in my life. Kind of interesting because um, at that point in time during those, uh, uh, that period of time after the wall came down and so forth, there there were other uh, some other Christian organizations I won't mention, but one that I was somewhat affiliated with, that actually got involved and and were asked by the uh, head of the education system in Russia to actually come and begin teach biblical biblical principles. So it's interesting, isn't it, that when a culture actually hits rock bottom, uh, as they did under that godless communist system that they really almost kind of like, where else do we look? And they almost began to look up. Uh, in in that era, that aspect for that particular individual who said that to you, that older man, um, what was his experience with homeschooling? I mean, did he, do you remember how he came to be knowledgeable of homeschooling, and did he really under did he even understand what it was, or did he see it perhaps in like your life and the lives of other families who were schooling their children at home, and and, and he saw that togetherness that that obviously was had disappeared under the communist system. What, what was he What was he seeing? You know, that is an excellent question, Sam, and I'm not sure I can answer that completely. I can find out the answer for you, but I do know that he was probably working over there with the Russian families who were helping with this conference, and and I think he just saw the strength and unity in these families, and it was eye-opening for him because I have never heard such an impassioned plea or statement of advocacy for homeschooling, I think, in my life that equaled that. I think the other thing he saw was he just, he saw the decimation in the culture. And maybe the Holy Spirit was just speaking to him saying, this is the answer for that decimation. Uh, I'll never forget reading an article by Andrew uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn when he said that the hatred of God is the principal driving force behind communism. It's not politics. It's not economics. It's the hatred of God. It's their central pivot. And so I think he saw so much in his lifetime of decimation and destruction. And here he saw a positive answer to all of that. This is me assimilating and giving you an educated guess in my mind what happened. After after everything he had seen in his life, a, to- a culture that had totally forgotten God, and now in, ed- in in homeschooling, there was a way to educate their kids successfully, but with an emphasis on remembering God. Hmm. And and even as you're talking, Zan, it just um, you know just feel the Holy Spirit you know moving to to think about that, to think that the driving force behind. This horrible system that has caused so much damage throughout our world of communism is a hatred for God. And, uh, you know, you're quoting Alexander Solzhenitsyn, and and you've quoted him saying, you know, men have forgotten God. And that's a worldwide problem. That's a every generation problem. And again, I'm not telling you today that if you homeschool your children, it's going to solve every single problem. But homeschooling is an opportunity For you as a parent or a grandparent or a family member of somebody who you can help, maybe even do some of it, maybe you can help somebody financially to be able to afford to do something different so they can homeschool, but it's an opportunity to see those children trained about God, Uh, not just given over to a secular school system or something that will train them about whatever they want to train them, but they won't forget God because they'll know God, they'll know about God um, would be the goal and the prayer. 
Um, there's so much more we want to talk about. We, we, we want to keep picking your brain, um, and we want to talk also about um, Homeworks by Precept is uh, a group that you work with that works in conjunction with BJU Press, and they have an online uh, event coming up. We want to talk about that, how maybe there's somebody listening, and you want to know more about homeschooling, you want to know more about BJU Press. We've got a lot of information we want to give you, and uh, there's an upcoming event that I'm going to be a part of and Zan's going to be a part of uh, that you can tune into from your own home. And uh, so we have lots more. We're going to take another time out here from some more of our partners, and we'll be right back on Stand in the Gap today. Faithful listeners to Stand in the Gap today and guests alike appreciate the regular focus on truth and the analysis of the news from a biblical and constitutional perspective. Here's a comment from Dr. Alex McFarland, speaker, author, apologist, and founder of the ministry Truth for a New Generation. By the way, let me say how much I appreciate, Sam, what you all do in the American Pastors Network. And folks, I have pastored two churches and spoken in 2000, and I just want to encourage everybody to pray for what Sam and his staff are doing and to support and be involved. And frankly, I'm just applauding you. I follow your trajectory, Sam, and the American Pastors Network, and I'm thrilled that God has raised you up at this time. Thank you, Dr. McFarland. You and our other great guests helped to make Stand in the Gap today a leading voice in the faithful communication of truth all across America. May God use all of us together to stand in the gap for truth. Here's Twyla Brays with today's Health Freedom Minute. It's not an April Fool's joke. More and more Democrats are going anti-mask, especially those in vulnerable districts for re-election. Democrat U.S. House Representative Sean Maloney from New York, who is the chairman of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, said, I'm completely over mask mandates. I don't think they make any sense anymore. I'm for whatever gets rid of mask mandates as quickly as possible, end quote. In addition, eight Democrats voted with Republicans in the U.S. Senate to end the mask mandate in airports and on airplanes. But the Biden administration is holding on to the mandate. His administration wants to force us into the mask at its beck and call. We must refuse to be enslaved by the mask. We must say no. Help us secure health freedom for all. Visit cchfreedom.org. That's cchfreedom.org. When we look around, we can see the devil at work, sure. But more powerfully, we can see our great God at work, and he's moving his plan of redemption ahead right on time. God's Spirit's moving in the hearts of his people, too. Do you sense his hand? If so, we've got a job to do. So let's pray. Let's be truth tellers. Let's help lead people to a genuine return to God. Only true revival can bring peace in times of war and God's blessings in times of judgment. Visit our website at standinthegapradio.com or search on Amazon for our powerful tool specifically designed to equip believers for these days. Order our Return to God Journey Guide. Designed for personal training or within small groups or Sunday school classes, this small booklet is made to coordinate with our 11 Principles for National Renewal Stand in the Gap TV series. Learn more about the Return to God Journey Guide by going to standinthegapradio.com or search for it on Amazon. You're listening to Stand in the Gap today, discussing the pressing issues facing our culture from a biblical and constitutional perspective. Now let's rejoin our host. Well, welcome back to the program. And uh, before we uh, delve into asking um, Zan Tyler, our special guest who's on with us today as we talk about um, ways that developing the next generation, ways that training our children through homeschooling, through any any opportunity you have to help instill a biblical worldview on your children or your grandchildren or uh, extended family that you're in connection with, um, how that is a, an opportunity to give them the opportunity to know God better and to have a true heart for the Lord and to truly bring about revival in a generation and in a, a country that needs it because we've forgotten God in so many ways and in so many places. But before we go there, um, I just want to go to our, our program producer, Tim Schneider, and just, uh, Tim, could you give us any uh, quick updates on things that are going on at Stand in the Gap Media or American Pastors Network? 
Well, yes, I can, Isaac. Thank you very much. Good afternoon to everybody. Hopefully you're having a great Friday. I want to let you know about some things that we have going on around here at Stand in the Gap Media and the American Pastors Network. You heard us advertise about it for many months now, a letter from God.org, which is where you can go to find Letter to America from God. 23-minute video. Please go and check that out at letterfromgod.org. Also, a company, a pan, a, 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 a accompanying opinion thing. Uh, I'm going to try to get my words. But something that you can use with the letter for, to America from God.org is our Return to God Journey Guide, 11 Principles to National Renewal on Amazon. So if you have gone through and you've done the Letter to America from God video and you want to have something additional to add to that, we can go go on over to Amazon and check that out or go to our StandInTheGapMedia.org website. You can buy that. And also, if you have already gotten that journey guide, we encourage you highly to leave a review. A review will allow other people to see how you've been blessed by that. So please leave that over at Amazon and leave a rating so that other people can see what exactly the Return to God Journey Guide is about and if it's worth their time. Also, we got two great websites, AmericanPastorsNetwork.net and StandInTheGapMedia.org. You can sign up for e-newsletter over there. We'll only send you maybe an e-newsletter once a week, maybe twice a week. It just depends. Sometimes we won't even send you any e-newsletters, but you can get prayer request updates on how to pray for us here. You can sign up for our weekly radio recap email, which is really neat. Get an opportunity to see all the programs from the previous week, just in case you missed some. Also, you'll see a transcript of a previous program. Also, you'll have an opportunity to even hear some audio clips from a previous program. So make sure you sign up for that newsletter at AmericanPastorsNetwork.net. Also, we highly encourage you to please pray for this ministry. We can't do much without your prayers, so please pray for us. And also, if the Lord has blessed you financially and you're really blessed by this ministry, please consider giving to our organization so we can continue to do the things that we need to do. So I will go ahead, Isaac, and get it on back to you. Well, thank you very much, Tim. And uh, just kind of picking up on uh, some of the things you spoke about, if you haven't watched uh, the video, um, Letter from God, if you go to letterfromgod.org, uh, letterfromgod.org, uh, a really powerful video, a little over 20 minutes, and uh, just um, very uh, biblically based in the context of what would God say if we were, you know, if He were to to speak to us as Americans right now. And uh, this is based on biblical context here. Um, uh, if you haven't watched that, I would highly, highly encourage you to go to uh, Letter from God um, dot org. It's through the American Pastors Network uh, website there. And, and if you've watched it, I would really encourage you then, as Tim did too, uh, to get the booklet that goes along with it, the journey guide, uh, really helpful for yourself, for others, and this whole idea of biblical worldview and passing it on to the next generation. These are some free resources uh, to, to do that, that you can uh, use this media, use the downloadable version of the book, or, or purchase it for uh, very reasonable on Amazon. And uh, use that with maybe your children or your grandchildren or nieces and nephews or, you know, some kids that you babysit or something like that. And uh, and get some conversation going with maybe, you know, some middle schoolers or high schoolers. Uh, even my children um, are younger than that. My oldest is in middle school. My youngest is in first grade. And uh, they've been able to understand a lot of this. And we've watched it and talked about it. So, yes, uh, great, great resources there. Well, Zan, going going along with that, talking about passing on a biblical worldview and and uh, really training up our children in a, the fear of the Lord, as our own country, uh, and it's hard to say this, but I think everybody listening knows this is true. As our own country seems to be turning further and further and further away from God, further away from the truth, we're doing exactly what you said they uh, recognized they were had done in Russia, and that we've turned our back against God, we've forgotten God. And there, there, there seems to be a hatred for God among many movers and shakers in our culture. And so, uh, Zan, as our country does that, it seems like there are people, and it's not just the younger generation. I think sometimes we like to throw the younger generation under the bus, but they're being trained by generations that come before them. And there are people in our society that are embracing atheism, they're embracing socialism and even communism. And, and so as somebody who's been involved in the education movement, um, for so much of your life, and you've been involved as a concerned parent since the 1980s. What have you seen in our culture over the last couple of decades that uh, that keeps you going? That that has stirred you to to go around speaking, to write books and blogs, and to help people the way you have. What what are the concerns that you have for our own nation, for our own culture? 
You know, it's interesting, Isaac, to think through this, but as I have been studying um, Solzhenitsyn some, when he received his Templeton Award for Religion, I think this was back in the 80s, he said this, communism needs a country to be devoid of religious and national feeling in order to control it. This entails the destruction of faith and nationhood. And so we have not only seen the the destruction of faith or the abandonment of faith in our country we've all we've also seen the um destruction of our nationhood or or as your commercials say that i've been listening to not only biblical principles but constitutional principles that have always been in play in this country so i think the thing that homeschooling does is it gives parents an opportunity to teach their children from a biblical perspective and also to teach them the free, the principles of freedom that this country was founded on. Uh, we are seeing, I listened to a podcast by Oz Guinness not too long ago called the, uh, Dealing with the Rise of the Nuns. And he said, and this is not N-U-N-S, but N-O-N-E-S, with my southern accent, I may need to explain that. But he talked about those people who aren't identifying at all anymore with any religious affiliation or belief and how that is going up. I read, um, I I think the Pew Foundation said 30%. I know y'all have Barna on your show a lot, and I'm sure he's got some statistics on that. And and that is so concerning. And then, um, I I don't want to belabor this point, but Oz Guinness talked about Lord James Bryce in 1900. And he said, if you look at Europe in 1900, it's in a bad way. But Europe always does have a tradition of sort and social cohesion. People are living in small towns, small cities, and they hold each other accountable. Now, this is the early 1900s. But he said this, there's nothing that holds America together except for one thing, religion. And he meant Christianity by that. He said it's unthinkable that religion in America is anything but strong and powerful. If the day comes when America loses religion and faith, then there's nothing to hold America together. Uh, I think that's one of the most insightful comments that I've heard in terms of explaining what's happened in our culture just in the last two or three years. And uh, so I, I really do see homeschooling as an answer to those issues. And, and, and Zan, um, what you're saying, I mean, I'm, I'm nodding my head. People can't see it except if those who are watching, nodding my head saying, yeah, you're, you're exactly right. Now, let me ask you a personal question here because somebody listening to this who have not homeschooled, as an example, not really maybe as a parent or a grandparent overly involved in their children's education, uh, because most aren't, we know. They're not really overly involved. Here's a question I have for you. Is it um, the effectiveness of homeschooling from your experience? Because it, many cases it is. It's not, it's not the sole answer for all needs, but, but is it just the fact that a parent is teaching kids at home rather than some building outside that home? Is it the content of what that curriculum is being taught? And and here's the question. At the end of the day, who learns more, the parent or the child? <laughs> oh, my goodness. The parent learns more and the parent is sanctified more. <laughs> We are not talking about, we have some blissful and idyllic days in our homeschooling, but most of them are just a lot of hard work. And, uh, but, but you do, you just gave the best explanation ever. It's, it's the content coupled with the love of the parent and the children for each other and remembering God you know, teaching from a biblical worldview. I would love to tell you a story about this girl, Annie, I met. I was speaking at Freedom Day, Capital Day in I, in Idaho, uh, Iowa, for homeschoolers about two weeks ago. And Annie, who was a new homeschooler, came up to me, and she said, I need to tell you my story. I didn't want to homeschool. I, have my, I had my, my 9-year-old and 11-year-old in a trustworthy school district, but COVID hit, and I didn't like the virtual education, so I decided to homeschool for a year. And then I saw the content that my trustworthy school district was teaching, and I was appalled. 
And she said, now I'm in charge of education, and I've been worried that my 9-year-old is dyslexic. But all the teachers said, oh, don't worry about it. She'll grow out of it. But I took her to a specialist, and the specialist said, oh, she's definitely dyslexic. I just wish you had brought us to her three, brought her to us three years earlier. And she said mm. the coup de grace for her was when her 11-year-old, who had been to church and Sunday school every Sunday of his life, looked at her and said, Mom, until we started homeschooling, I didn't know God was everywhere. He's in history and math mm. and science. I didn't know that till this year. Oh, how exciting. That, that's, that's what it's all about, is letting them see God at work in every facet of life, and that's what a true biblical worldview is. That's what we need. And so many people, if you would ask them, they think that they have a biblical worldview in their family. Sometimes it takes something like what we've had in the last few years. We're going to be right back on Stand in the Gap today. From the time our children are born until the moment they leave our homes as young adults, Christian parents are given the privilege and responsibility of guiding them into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. All during their growing years, they're influenced by the people and events around them. Sometimes these are out of our control, but many times we can make choices as to how they'll be educated, what church they'll attend, and the overall atmosphere of our home. If you've decided your child is best influenced by a biblical worldview education, you'll want to consider Bob Jones University Press homeschool materials. Dedicated to academic excellence, BJU Press offers a curriculum that not only assists you to pass along your values to your children, but makes it easy and affordable. The decisions your child makes in response to the challenges and opportunities they face in life are largely determined by their inner spiritual compass. Is your child ready for the journey? Find out more at BJUPress.com. For years, faithful Christians formed nonprofit foundations or trusts to preserve their ability to generously give to their favorite causes or ministries, even after their death. The problem? Professional managers, pressure from left-wing agendas, and even family members with opposing views hijacked the original donor intent. This is sad, but true. But this subversion of purpose can be prevented. Hello, I'm Sam Rohr of the American Pastors Network, and I'm glad to recommend Capstone Legacy Foundation in Wayne, Pennsylvania, an experienced and capable Christian community foundation established to help you set up a ministry, a giving structure guaranteed not to be hijacked, or a place you can donate cash or non-cash assets like stocks, bonds, or property Capstone's designed to help you achieve immediate tax savings and give you needed time to decide how to prayerfully allocate your giving. Contact Capstone at 610-688-8890 or visit them at capstonelegacy.org. This is Tim Barton from Wall Builders with another moment from American history. In 1963, the United States Supreme Court decided that voluntary Bible reading could no longer be part of the school day. Founding Father Benjamin Rush, known as the father of public schools under the Constitution, pointedly warned that the Bible should be read in schools in preference to all other books. He specifically warned that if America ever ceased promoting biblical principles in schools, then we would waste so much time and money in punishing crimes and take so little pains to prevent them. He was right. We now have 7 million Americans in prison, on probation, or on parole, and the United States has the highest incarceration rate in the world. Sadly, this was unnecessary, but is the result of no longer teaching the morals of the Bible in schools. For more information about the Founding Fathers' views on the positive impact of the Bible in schools, go to wallbuilders.com. You can't learn from history if you erase it. For the Colson Center, I'm John Stone Street with The Point. What happens to fascist architecture after fascism? Asked a recent BBC Culture headline. Good question. Because buildings are made by peoples and cultures, they're never just functional, they tell stories. For example, a tax office in Balzano, Italy, features a mural of Benito Mussolini on horseback giving his infamous straight arm salute. Well, for decades, the building has sparked conflict until yearly neo fascist rallies and bombing attempts forced leaders to seek a compromise in 2017. So the tax office was left standing, its mural still visible, but over the top the words of Hannah Arendt were written in LED lights, nobody has the right to obey. In other words, the duty of conscience triumphs over the demands of totalitarian regimes. Incredibly, the compromise seems to have eased the tension. We need not choose between romanticizing or demolishing history. Sometimes it's enough to let truth be put in context and then learn from it. 
I'm John Stone Street. You're listening to Stand in the Gap today. For more information, visit our website at standinthegapradio.com. Welcome back to the program. We're talking uh, with our, our good friend and return guest, um, a special um, speaker, author, homeschool expert, uh, Zan Tyler. And Zan, uh, thank you again so much. And uh, your partnership with BJU Press through uh, Homeworks by Precept. Um, and, uh, we, you know, we also have been partnered with BJU Press here at State in the Gap Media for, for quite a few years. Um, but, Zan, we've been talking about how we can see revival in our nation by parents and grandparents um, really investing in their children or their grandchildren, investing in the next generation and teaching them the Bible, giving them a biblical worldview in all areas and all subjects, and uh, really the, the neat opportunities that there are through through a good homeschool education. And not all homeschooling is the same, and every family is going to be different, just like every school has its differences. Um, but uh, but really, these neat advantages that are out there. Um, but Zan, I, I want to talk to you about an upcoming event that's going on an online event that anybody listening to us can, you know, just log on to it. It's a free event with all kinds of neat things, even some, um, uh, you know, things that are uh, discounts and prizes and drawings. But, uh, but first of all, I want to just say that I have been noticing almost every church I go to, it seems like um, I was just at a church on Sunday. In fact, I, I wasn't even preaching there, but I was there representing American pastors network and staying in the gap media. And somebody came up to my wife and said, Hey, um, and, and they know that you know that we homeschool. They know our connection with BJU Press. And she said, "I am planning on homeschooling my grandchildren next year." And I get that almost every church I go to, I'm, I'm seeing uh, two trends. One is many grandparents are out there, and they are helping or even doing most of the work of homeschooling their grandchildren. I know in our home, uh, we've moved back to my wife's hometown. And her parents are able to help with some of the subjects. And uh, my father-in-law is retired from the public school district, and he loves woodworking, and my kids can learn learn woodworking from him. There's a retired uh, widow lady in our church who teaches my daughter uh, sewing and uh, knitting and things. There are uh, relatives that, you know, and friends that do farming or other construction things that my kids get to learn from. It's, It's a neat Opportunity. Sometimes um, Hillary Clinton was famous for saying it takes a village to raise a child. Well, raising a a homeschool child with the backing of a family and a church is also really exciting and really helpful. But Zane, could you talk to us a little bit um, about how maybe somebody who's uh, trying to help with their grandchildren's homeschool, or maybe we have parents like my wife and I, we work from home and we homeschool while working from home. Um, what what opportunities there might be for them in this upcoming online event and how they can find out more about that and log, you know, log into it for free uh, coming up here in just a couple of weeks? Oh, Isaac, thank you for teeing that up for me because this we have an online event that is like no other, an online party. It's April 18th through 22nd. It's free. It's eight hours a day, 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's free, but you have to register before 9 o'clock on April 18th. And for the party and to register, the URL is homeschoolhelp.com slash party. Actually, that's where you go to register and find out about the party. So it's homeschoolhelp.com slash party. There's a registration field. We've got great speakers this year. So this is the whole event is is designed to encourage and inform people who are homeschooling or want to homeschool. So we have Christy Clover speaking, who's an an expert on homeschooling and home organization. We have Ginger Hubbard speaking, who has many books on parenting that so many of our audience listen to. And then, Isaac, we have you doing a special um, slot for us on the importance of family discipleship, and we're so excited about that. So there there are so many things. We're going to have discounts and prizes and drawings, uh, a lot of fun interaction from those who are attending and the threads. And uh, I think it's just it is a great way to be encouraged and learn more about homeschooling. And I'm looking forward to that event, uh, to speaking and to listening to. I know my my wife um, has logged on for those um, online ones, and she just says they're well. And I've watched parts of them too. It's just so well done, so helpful. It's not just a waste of time. It's not tedious. It's it's um, it's helpful and enjoyable. Very practical. 
Um, so thank you so much for the work you're doing with that, for the work you're doing for families. Um, as we get ready to, to wrap things up here, are there any other um, points of interest or information that you would like to, to give to our audience uh, that could help them, whether it be about homeschooling or just training up of children um, or, or any really any regard before we wrap things up? I'm going to go to Sam and have him kind of close our program out. You know, I think I just want to remind people that homeschooling is a revival movement on so many different levels. It's definitely an educational revival movement. Our kids are doing super. Um, The test scores show that college admissions people are just coming out of the woodwork to recruit them. We've moved the bell curve over a quartile in terms of how we do on standardized testing. But the other thing is is I really believe it's a family and just a spiritual revival movement. I heard uh, an an expert theologian who had studied all the great revivals in the world. I asked him, he was speaking at our church, and I said, do you believe that homeschooling is a revival movement? And he said, well, Zan, what was the homeschool revival? I mean, what was the revival verse for the Puritans? I didn't know. And he said, it's the verse from Malachi 4, 6. Uh, about God turning the hearts of the fathers toward the children and the hearts of the children to the parents. And he said, because I Mm. see that happening in the homeschooling movement, I definitely believe it's a revival movement. So if you're looking for hope for your family, um, I I just cannot encourage you to homeschool them enough, homeschool your children or your grandchildren. Mm. Mm. Well, thank you, and thank you for... um not just talking about it, but really, uh, you know, putting um, putting yourself out there, helping so many people develop things, helping different states and regions develop this, and now uh, partnering for, for a long time now with um, BJU Press and, and uh, Homeworks by Precept. And uh, what you have done has influenced so many of us uh, who are uh, trying to raise our children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Um, and so uh, thank you very much, and thanks for for coming on this program and, and for all of this information and all this helpful context uh, as we look for revival and look for um, a biblical worldview that can be handed on to the next generation. And and Sam, with that, um, it really ties right in with what we do every day here at Stand in the Gap Media, every day with American Pastors Network as we uh, network with different preachers, pastors, the pulpit, as well as the pew, um, congregants and churches, ministries, across the, the, the nation and really across the world, helping uh, inform, helping um, with, through Stand in the Gap be a you know, public square opportunity to, to really give out a biblical worldview. Uh, but you have also experienced, uh, your children have grown up now um, being homeschooled, and you've experienced what Zan has experienced and what she's talking about. So I'll just uh, give you the last few minutes here to, to give any closing comments, any remarks, and then um, if time to, to close our program in prayer as well. Well, Isaac, uh, one thing that Zan that you just said was that um, uh, you noticed within homeschooling the hearts of the fathers being turned to their children and the children to the fathers. And I noted that because, you know, that is one of the things that when children are sitting under the direct instruction of their parents, and I asked you that question earlier, what kind of an impact did it have on you? Did you learn more or did your children learn more? A homeschooling experience is really both learning. Uh, it's very difficult for a parent to homeschool their children if they are not actually practicing what they are uh, preaching and teaching. And uh, the transparency that develops, of those of you who have not done this or grandma or grandparents who are looking and saying, can I help with my grandchildren? Yeah, the involvement of you with your children will do things that's beyond the, your imagination because that's really God's design. And, uh, and so, anyways, we'll stop right there. I'll just pray just briefly. Heavenly Father, Lord, we've talked about a lot of things here today. Just thank you for Zan and what she has said. And for those who are listening, May they um, be encouraged to be engaged in a way perhaps they've never been done before because, Lord, we know you will bless it when parents engage directly with their children. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, thank you for listening today. uh, And please remember, wherever you are, whatever is happening, stand in the gap for truth where you are today. If you like today's program, tell a friend. You'll also want to hear Stand in the Gap Weekend 
and watch the nationally syndicated Stand in the Gap TV program. We present the news of the day truthfully, carefully, and consistently from a biblical worldview and constitutional perspective. If you're hungry for the truth, visit StandInTheGapMedia.org to find all our programs and the stations that carry them. While you're there, be sure to download our free app and support this ministry with your best financial gift. Then join us again right here Monday through Friday for another program of Stand in the Gap Today.